Today, we'll find out if you can print warp-free nylon without an enclosure by using a few tricks such as printing upside down. I was sent an interesting challenge from a viewer. Try printing upside down to improve success with nylon. You might have seen an awesome video from Kralin 3D. It features a custom 3D printer that packs down to the size of a box of filament. Its innovative design has an inverted bed that means that it prints upside down. This is an incredible feat of engineering, so please check it out. But this challenge was sent to me before that video came out and relates to printing with regular 3D printers. The email was titled Upside Down Printing, which I assumed was a joke about me being in Australia. But once I read it, I saw that not only was it serious, but it also warranted some investigation. The idea is to print nylon upside down using a draft shield to trap a warm pocket of air around the printed part. JR from Makerspace Adelaide had had success with this and invited me to try it. He even provided a video of the concept in action using a Creality CR6 SE. Now I have a series where I built up an enclosed and actively heated Ender 5 and I had previously tested it with nylon where I found that it still warped badly to the point that the printed parts weren't actually usable. So is this a 3D printing hack that makes printing nylon just as effective on an open frame machine as one with an enclosure? Well, I was pretty curious to find out. So we're gonna start by breaking down the theory. Let's start with the difficult filament and I've made a whole video on this before, but we'll do a quick recap. Some filaments are quite dimensionally stable as we print them, which means they hold their shape. Other filaments, such as ABS and nylon, suffer from quite a lot of shrinkage as they cool down, leading to warping, which can lift the model off the bed, or in extreme cases, tear itself apart. That's because as our print progresses, we have a very hot section next to the nozzle, a warm section at the bed, but everything else in between is cooling down and contracting. With filaments like ABS and nylon, the dimensional instability from this shrinkage is more extreme, with the internal stresses being strong enough to lift up the corners off the bed, rip apart the models at the ley lines, or with challenging models, both. When we introduce an enclosure, not only do we exclude any cool drafts in the room from blowing on the model, but the ambient air around the model is warmer than it would normally be, meaning that our printed part shouldn't cool down as much as usual, and with that comes a reduction in the internal forces that make the model warp. But this technique doesn't use an enclosure. Instead, it uses a draft shield shown here in brown, which is continuously printed around the model as it progresses and acts like a localized open top enclosure, blocking cool drafts from the room and ideally trapping a warm pocket of air around the model, minimizing cool down and warpage. Where this technique takes things a step further is by turning the whole printer upside down with the theory that hot air rises, so any hot air will be pushed up and trapped in between the model and the draft shield. Now, before you watch any further, pause the video, head to the comment section and get in your predictions. Done? Good. Here's my testing methodology. Firstly, the printer that I'm using is the FL Sun Super Racer, which I recently converted to Clipper. It can hit the temperatures required for nylon, but most importantly, after we remove the spool holder from the top, there's absolutely nothing stopping us from inverting the printer and using it upside down. I feel it's the perfect choice for my tests because it's so convenient. The nylon I'm using spent overnight in a dehydrator to try and dry it out, and then after this, all printing was done from a dry box, which was easy to position in both orientations. Furthermore, its feed tube clipped nicely over the tube for the printer, keeping everything sealed. I'm printing at 270 degrees for the nozzle, 100 degrees for the bed, the part cooling fan off, and the base feed rate slowed down to 50 millimeters per second. I also used heaters in the room to make sure the ambient temperature was always close to 20 degrees. My aim was to pick models that I knew would warp, print a baseline with the printer in the standard position and no draft shield, a comparison print, again with the printer the right way up, but this time the draft shield, and then a third print running the same G-code, but this time with the printer upside down. During printing, I would use a thermal camera to try and monitor the temperature gradient across the part, and the finished prints would be inspected to make a comparison of warping. So on with testing, or so I thought, because I had to overcome some problems with the prints sticking to the bed. Last time when I printed nylon, it was onto painter's tape, and it really didn't go well. 
I started this time printing on the clean but bare ceramic coated glass bed. And although the first layer went down well, it wasn't too long until this happened. And this was repeatable across several retries, so clearly I needed a better solution. Something I had purchased in the past was this Dimmerfix print bed adhesive pen. We start by giving it a really good shake, remove the lid and apply it to a room temperature print bed. The applicator tip is like a sponge and the fluid will leak out allowing you to build up a thin layer. A few minutes later it will dry to a haze. At this point you're ready to go ahead and start your print job. And I did find that Dimmerfix helped adhesion but not enough for my prints to be successful. I noticed early on that it was still starting to warp. This became quite pronounced around halfway through the print and very soon after we had a failure. So instead I chose to use a regular glue stick attempting to apply the glue as thinly and uniformly as possible, although as you'll later see, I'm not really the best at this. The good news is, it did the trick. The early layers stuck quite well, and although later in the print, some sections of the model still warped, each print job was still able to make it to the end, which is exactly what I needed. So glue stick does work well on this bed, it's just a shame that over time, it builds up to be quite a mess. With that sorted, let's move on to my first test object and why I picked it. My first test print was this mini F1 car model designed by an X student. It's pretty ideal for a warp test and let me explain why with a section view. If we cut it in half and look from the side, we can see that the extremities poke out and are quite thin, but as we head towards the center of the model, everything becomes a lot thicker. The extremities will cool a lot faster than the bulky parts next to them and the internal forces almost guarantee that this front wing will peel upwards. If we section and look from the front, we have a similar but less dramatic version where the wheels are. The wheels already curl underneath, inviting the edges to lift, but once again we can expect the extremities to cool the most, shrinking the outer surfaces and almost guaranteeing that the bottom of the tyres will peel up. And as we saw earlier, everything went exactly as planned. And once a section starts to lift off, it's no longer touching the bed, cools even more and the problem is exaggerated. The trouble was that after I introduced the glue stick, the model stuck so well that warping was no longer a problem. So back to the drawing board. On this small scale using the glue, this print was just too easy, so I decided to scale it up. By scaling up the model, we got the exact result we wanted. The print was able to finish, but it had noticeable warping, and this provides an excellent baseline for testing. So time for a draft shield. In Prusa Slicer and Super Slicer, we find the option under Skirt and we simply tick Draft Shield. This will extend your regular skirt vertically upwards regardless of the model geometry. In Cura, it's underneath Experimental and we tick Enable Draft Shield. Like Prusa Slicer, we can set the distance which works just like a regular skirt, but an additional option in Cura where we can limit the height of the shield, in this example stopping it at 25mm. In Simplify 3D, we find this feature under additions and it's called ooze shield. We have a vertical option and that acts just like the other slices, but we also have the waterfall and contoured versions, which will more closely follow the shape of the model. When I was printing the original mini F1 car, the glue did such a good job that the front wing stayed stuck to the bed. And as you can see, it's the same color and therefore the same temperature. For this scaled up version, we can see that it's darker and therefore cooler than the heated bed as it starts to peel up. Early on in the print with the ooze shield, I don't think this really changed. As we can see the heated bed is much warmer than the model above it. It's no surprise then that the expected areas all start to cool, warp and delaminate. So what about if we run the same ooze shield G code but with the printer upside down, which by the way looks quite outrageous in the Octoprint webcam feed. Early on I would say it looked promising, with limited colour variation in the thermal camera, but as the print progresses, the camera picks up much more contrast and it looks quite the same as the other prints. It's worth noting that in all of these tests, the ooze shield is the first thing to warp and lift up, although the glue stick did an admirable job of stretching and preserving somewhat of a barrier, although there's no doubt its ability to hold in warm air is diminished. So here's the second print, obviously using an ooze shield but printed the right way up and the first thing to notice is how warped the ooze shield became. From the top this print looks okay but once we put the model against a flat edge we can see just how warped it is. The same applies when looking from the back and examining how much the wheels have lifted. So is the version printed upside down any better? Well we have the same warping on the ooze shield 
and we also have warping from front to back when holding the model against a ruler. Looking from the back, things seem pretty similar as well. Putting the normal and upside down versions belly to belly shows that the upside down version on the right maybe has slightly less warp. This is evident at the rear as well, and looking from the back, I think the slightly less warp on the upside down print once again. No dramatic difference for me, but maybe the problem was I was printing a wide model and instead I needed to try one that was taller and narrow. Enter my purpose designed warp testing piece. Its feet extend out and are pointy, and the whole shape tapers inwards. The aim once again is for the extremities to cool first, contract and then lift up the edges. For this object, I followed my same process, printing one without the shield, one with the shield, and then an inverted version also with the shield. For the thermal imaging, the print was so tall and narrow that the effector blocked the view, so I hung around until the print was finished and then pointed the camera inside. Here's the normal version, and here's the upside down version, and to me they look quite similar. I'm not sure a thermal camera is the best tool for this. Ideally we'd have a thermocouple sitting in between the print and the shield, but the shield is added layer by layer, so the cable would get in the way. Here's the final result for the unshielded version, and as expected, each corner has lifted up. Here's the shielded version printed the right way up, and to me, the warping in the corners looks at least as bad. And finally, here's the upside down version, and once again to me, it looks quite the same. Putting the two shielded versions base to base, like the Mini F1 car, looks pretty much identical to my eye. So this technique didn't work out for me, but I would still say that my results are somewhat inconclusive. The first thing we need to discuss is whether hot air actually rises. I discussed this with my patrons, and here's a little demonstration of why it's not that simple. Into this glass, we start by pouring some cooking oil. And following this, we pour in a similar amount of water. And what we find is that the oil, even when churned up with the water, appears to rise up and rest on top. And this is simply because the oil is less dense than the water, just like hot air is less dense than cold. Inside our ooze shield, we have relatively warmer and cooler air, so the cooler air could sink to the bottom and displace the warmer air upwards. This still fits with the upside down printing theory, but unfortunately there's other variables that muddy the waters. For my printing, I had the part cooling fan disabled, but there's still the heat sink fan that's active. It's not much, but there will be airflow coming out around the hot end that potentially interferes with the air pocket inside the shield. The printer I use for these tests is a Delta printer, which means the object remains stationary throughout the print. However, in JR's tests, he used an i3 bed slinger, and that means the printed object is moving back and forth the whole time during the print, and I would think that that's the equivalent of a cool draft blowing on the print, and therefore the draft shield might be more effective. There's also going to be variations in material. Of course, there's many different brands and formulations of nylon, but there's also variables in how it's stored and how much moisture it's absorbed. In my case, the most significant factor in success was using glue stick on the bed, but this technique did allow models in nylon that he couldn't do otherwise. I couldn't replicate this, but for me, what's really important is the fresh problem solving approach that might end up leading to a bigger breakthrough. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy upside down 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.